Hello, DC Denizens. I am Rosie Knight, a journalist and author who you may sometimes find at dc.com. And today I'm here for a really exciting live Q&A with Tom Taylor. The Dawn of DC initiative has been delivering the most exciting stories this year, from events like Lazarus Planet, Night Terrors, Batman Catwoman, The Gotham War, to relaunch series like Superman, Wonder Woman, Blue Beetle, Birds of Prey, Green Arrow, and many more. But this November, As you all know, DC has turned the action up to 11 with the launch of the next great event in the dawn of DC, and it is Titans Beast World. I cannot wait to share more about it with you today with the architect of this incredible series, Titans writer Tom Taylor. And here he is. Hello. How you doing? I'm the person wearing like the same t-shirt as you and the same bookshelf. Weird. We didn't Hi. even plan this. It's incredible. Didn't even coordinate. It just happened. Yeah. <laughs> just Tim Patsko, how are you doing, Tom? Thanks so much for joining I'm us. I'm very well, thank you. I am awake. That's that's rare at this time in Australia. <laughs> yeah. That's the important thing. We need you awake that's to right. talk about this. I mean, I'm so happy to be here talking with you today. I used to work in a comic shop in London, and I just remember the impact of injustice. I mean, I'm also going to be the cool- coolest aunt in the world because my nephew just <laughs> loves DC so much. And I'm awesome. a huge cosmic fan, so I'm absolutely adoring Beast World. So first of all, just to get us started, was this always the plan? Like, were you, Nicholas Scott and Bruno Redondo, always leading up to this with Titans and Nightwing? Uh, yeah, I mean, at a certain point, yes, this definitely became the plan. Certainly around the same time as I was starting Titans, there was this idea kicking around of this event. And it's like, oh, well, Tom, what do you think you could do? I'm like, well, I've got this idea that I was sort of wanting to lead to in Titans. And if we wanted to expand that to be even bigger, then yes, please, can I do that? Um, and that's kind of where it went. But it, it was great because it, instead of being an event that sort of you know, could potentially pop out of nowhere. It was, it was built really organically in the pages mm. of Titans and in a little bit of Nightwing, but nobody knows that yet. <laughs> and the thing is that I'm really excited about that, I mean, I'm sure you've talked about this a little bit, but as far as my research goes, this is the first ever big DC event focused on the Titans. So can you talk a little bit about that? Is that true? Is it the Titans' first kind of focal point in a DC event? It is true. It is the Titans' first event, which is ridiculous because they've been around <laughs> forever. Um, so I think everyone just assumed they they'd had their moment in the sun, but they but they haven't. And as we've now made them the premier superhero team in the DC universe, now is their time for the entire universe to be threatened and for them to step up and hopefully save it. I won't tell you how it ends. <laughs> <laughs> Well, expanding on that a little bit, I am a huge Gar fan. I love Beast Boy. So could you talk about the moment when you decided that he was the right character to be kind of the catalyst of this event? I think as soon as I started writing Titans, or potentially just before, I I, I came to the realisation that Gar is essentially the heart of the Titans. And mm-hmm. I'm a terrible person, so I know that the the way to hurt people and the way to engage people is to tear out their hearts um in a sense so that's that's what we did we found a way that beast boy being so core to the titans being you know being the partner of raven being the friends of everybody being so attuned to the planet and to to animals and to the environment uh of course he was the one we should we should harm but also before that we give him this moment we give him the moment where only only Beast Boy can save the world. And that's, yeah, what he does in issue one. He literally saves every single person on the planet. He does what Superman, that Wonder Woman, not Batman can't. And how happy with yourself were you when you came up with Garo? <laughs> because it's Garo. so good. <laughs> there was a moment. I remember, I think I, I, I wrote a mini Bible for all of this for the other authors and I, I remember an email very distinctly from Cy Spurrier, who's the Flash writer at the moment, just writing to me and just said, Garu, you mad genius. And that was it. I'm like, yep, <laughs> nailed it. <laughs> yeah, I yelled. I yelled when I read it on the page. Yeah. Could you speak a little bit about that, building that juxtaposition of Gar getting to save the world, but then at that cost and kind of when the Gar, Staro, Garo idea came into your head? 
I see. I cannot remember. I think I was in Spain potentially talk, talking to Brittany over Zoom. Uh, I was probably with Jess Chan, our former Nightwing editor at Bruno Redondo. Um, and I think I was coming up with the idea then of this this threat to the planet. How could I how could I threaten the whole planet in a way that only Beast Boy could step up? And so what can Beast Boy do? He could turn into any animal. I've seen it on <laughs> Titans Go. Um, and of course, that is a star. That is a star conqueror that he turns into to save us all. Viral whale. He has to turn into a whale so that his brain capacity increases. So he has the he understands how to make the next step. Those are the important grounded parts that make turning into Absolutely. Starro believable. Oh. <laughs> Otherwise, it would be unbelievable that this that this small person could turn into a giant star conqueror the size of a continent. It would nobody would believe it unless he turned into a whale first. It's got to be steps, <laughs> levels. It's got to be organic. You know the That's transformation. That's right. Got to be organic. Yeah. So. Something that I'm really interested in, you've got another of my favorite characters here, Amanda Waller, one of the most complex characters in the DC universe. She seems like she's going to have a substantial role to play in Beast World. So could you sort of tease a little bit about what she's up to and kind of what how her plans are going to impact the event going forward? This is uh, Amanda Waller's moment where she transforms into something bigger to become something bigger. Um, this is her organic transformation. Basically, this is Amanda Waller's level up moment. Um, mm. This has been planned for a long time between myself and a lot of other creators at DC. We've been talking about where we want to position Amanda for a long time. And Beast World is the moment it all begins. You see that she is sort of the power behind everything that goes wrong. And then I can't tell you what happens next, but her and Peacemaker and and a new villain called Dr. Hate uh, are really central to all of this. So while the world will look at Beast Boy and look at him infecting the planet and sort of think, well, he's behind it, you know, or his, his loss of his mind is behind this, it's, yeah, there's certainly the people pushing the buttons in the background. What is it about Amanda Waller that you think makes her such an intriguing character? Because we are seeing a renaissance in for her, both on TV, film, and in the comics. And you mentioned this is something that multiple writers have wanted to do. So what do you think it is about her that makes her such a compelling villain? Uh, I think it's a conviction. I think it's just that she will do whatever it takes. I mean, you know, I've I've been the writer of The Suicide Squad. I've I've been in the background of that. I've I've, I've read so much Walla. And I think the scariest thing about her is that she thinks she's right. And when Mm -hmm. you have a villain or you know, a, an antagonist who does believe in what they're doing. And she is dead set against the superheroes of the planet. Then that positions her in a way that's really, well, it's just juicy to write. It's lots of fun. <laughs> <laughs> Which is the most important thing. That's, the, that's exactly it. Speaking of very fun things to write, who is your favorite garrowed up, like DC superhero? Like who's your favorite version of a superhero who's gotten the gas for because i just think uh, that's such a adventurous place to get to play around in look i think i mean i i love what everybody else is doing like here's the thing it's it's not just me obviously we have the beast world tour books and we have all these great creators coming on and watching what people have decided to do with this sort of open slate it's like yeah turn them into what you'd like and some people have taken it in hideous horrific ways <laughs> You know, like you've got Godspeed turning into a hornet, which is horrific. Like that's that's really quite scary. Um, Godspeed suddenly being able to fly and have a stinger is scary. And then you've got people who are like, we're going to turn Harley Quinn into a giant muscled bunny. I'm like, sure, go, have fun. And, you know, we, we turn Batman into a wolf and, you know, spoiler, but Nightwing does turn into a fox because we, I don't know, we like pleasing the internet. <laughs> I saw the covers and they were going to, yeah. they were pleasing the internet. Were there yeah. any, that's one of the greatest things about making comics is, is the collaboration and kind of seeing where other people take your ideas and run with it. Were there any garrowed up characters that really shocked you or surprised you? Was there one that you got back where you were like, I would never have thought of that. Uh, I will, I won't say who, but somebody is turned into a cephalopod. <laughs> I remember that showing up in my inbox one day, and I'm just like, oh, wow, okay, yeah, cool, <laughs> go for it. Um, but, yeah, but certainly people are having fun. It's I will say that. 
Um, and, you know, and I just turn lots of things into bears to give a hard time to Gail Simone. Hi, Gail. Anyway. <laughs> got to give some little homages to That's right. the comic book fren- frenemies and icons like Gail. Absolutely. So, speaking of collaboration, the team on this book is unbelievable. I mean, I'm really slow because Maya, like, what's it been like? to get those pages back and to see this kind of being brought to life? Because that's such a fantastic part of being a comic book writer. Uh, it's absurd. Like getting getting art from Ivan uh, and Danny Mickey and Brad Anderson, this is this is a team that you that you dream of. These are this Ivan is somebody who can make superheroes look absolutely iconic. And I've watched his art and I've seen his events for years. So getting the chance to work with him in this way is incredible and every page you come through especially those splash pages that you feel incredibly guilty about writing it's like <laughs> yeah there's like 27 people in this panel i'm so sorry and then it comes through and you're like i'm not sorry anymore this is amazing um and then yeah we were really fortunate to have lucas just stepping up in this ridiculous way he's far too mm-hmm. young to be as good as he is um and he's just stepped in to to do the other issues and he's just leveled up he's done that he is the beast boy turning into the whale turning into gara is lucas wow yeah and you mentioned you know you're a fan of ivan that's one of the best things about getting to work in this space is there's so many brilliant artists was there a character you knew you really wanted him to draw like you'd seen his other work and you were like the character i really need to see him draw is so you wrote it in i think i just wanted to see i just wanted to see him do right now draw all of the titans that was yeah. the most exciting thing for me. As soon as I saw him drawing Starfire, um, there's a scene where they're sort of all flying out and Starfire is leading it. And, you know, and in the background is, you know, there's Superman, there's Wonder Woman, but it's like, oh, wow. <laughs> Those this guys. Is, you know, yeah, but he does he does this thing where he just positions the heroes of the story in such an incredibly heroic way. Um, and it's exciting every single panel. Yeah, you mentioned, you know, we talked a little bit about Waller and obviously you mentioned Dr. Hate. Could you tease a few more of the other DC supervillains that the Titans may come up against as the event moves forwards? Sure, I can tell you. I mean, there are characters like Killer Croc in there. Um, there's obviously Peacemaker, which we have quite a bit to do with, uh, which we bump up against quite a bit. But I will say that it, largely this is not a story about villains because mm. everybody you know, anybody can be infected. Yes, Black Adam is turned into a lion man on the last page of our first <laughs> issue. Um, so he's going to cause some trouble. But there are others as well. We've already seen on covers. So you can see that Power Girl is turned into essentially a flame bird. Um, mm-hmm. And there are, you know, it's not just the villains. Anybody can be a threat in this story. Yeah, something that I found really spoke to me about the first issue. I love Cosmic DC. I love out their stories but you really balance it with a grounded emotional nature which I think comes from like you said Gar being the heart of the titans but could you talk a little bit about when you're saying things like power girl turns into a flame bird how do you kind of (laughs) as a writer keep that reality and heart that will keep people caring even as the stakes get you know cosmic and totally outrageous uh, because, yeah, I, I don't think there's a point to a story like this unless you can, unless it's about character. Yes, mm-hmm. it's about a giant star conqueror and his spores turning people into beasts. But at the heart of it, it's about a friend potentially being mm-hmm. lost and his infection potentially meaning other friends are lost. This is, you know, if you're if you're Nightwing and you're watching Batman, you're watching your dad turned into a wolf and going, he might not come back. You know, that is that is the heart of all of this. It's it's wanting to protect the planet. And for the Titans to have this as their first moment, their first moment where they have to step up and they're the protectors of the world and the world is just going to hell, effectively. Um, you know, that is the emotion of it. For Nightwing, who's become this amazing leader and been asked to lead, and the first thing that happens to his world is this. And it happens, they believe, at this point, because of a friend. You know, it is a friend that's at the heart of this that is the threat here um, because they don't know about Dr. Hate or Amanda Waller. So, yeah, it's all it's all fun. It's juicy. I like it. What's it been like for you? You kind of talked about making Titans the premier team in the DC Universe. What's the 
journey been like from taking these characters who are known as teens, these kind of characters who do have a massive beloved fandom, but bringing them to the forefront of the DC and now seeing them and getting to herald them through this massive kind of game changing event. What's that journey been like? Uh, it's been fantastic. I mean, obviously it started in the pages of Nightwing when Rita Redondo and I came on to that book. We really wanted to show the world why Nightwing is an A-lister, why mm -hmm. he is one of the greatest superheroes on the planet. Um, so that was our first sort of stepping stone to getting the rest of the Titans to here. So having Dick Grayson be asked to lead by Wonder Woman, by Superman, by Batman, have the Trinity come in and say, it's your time. Um, this is just fulfilling a promise that I think has always been there. You know, mm -hmm. from, from the 80s, there's always been this idea that one day the Teen Titans will grow up to be the Titans and they won't take over the Justice League. They will be the Titans and the Titans will be the premier superhero team in the world. And that's that's what we're getting to do now. And so we get, and they're, they're so powerful. This is the thing about the Titans. People, you know, these are not sidekicks. Starfire, mm -hmm. Donna Troy, Cyborg, The Flash, you know, none of these people are, these are people who could stand their ground against anyone. These are people who can go up against Darkseid. These are people who are not going to flinch in the face of anything. Yeah, and kind of talking about their power and the power of this event, something that's been very kind of, we all know from the beginning and from the outset that this event with Titans Beast World and everything that's coming out of it, that's going to have ramifications that, spread across the DC universe. So could you talk a little bit about that and kind of knowing that you're shaping the future of this sprawling, you know, beloved universe? Yeah, look, it, this does have large ramifications. We've talked about Amanda Waller. Um, we can't talk about Dr. Haight at this point. We have no <laughs> idea who's underneath the helmet, uh, but that is certainly going to have ramifications. Um, I can't speak too much about it, but I can tell you that there has been a plan and there's been a plan in place for a very long time. Um, yes, this does take us to the next step. This takes us to the next evolution of Dawn of DC, of the DC universe. Um, and I can't I can't tease too much. Um, I, did, I did tell the Batman group that Batman would be a bat wolf forever now and they'll just have to deal with that. And I <laughs> that's canon. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's canon now. So that's just going to happen. Deal with it. Uh, no. <laughs> no, there, there are large ramifications. You know, this event is so central to the Titans and the entire world mm -hmm. is watching and the entire world will be watching at the end of this as well. For you, what are you most excited about? That obviously, I know you can't spoil it, <laughs> but is there like a character beat or a page turn? Is there something that you're just waiting for people to discover and pick up the issue and kind of go, oh, this is it? Definitely. I think the identity of Dr. Hate is a huge one. I think that's nobody. Amazingly, no one has guessed it yet. I mean, I, the whole thing <laughs> like there. That sounds like a challenge. Like, but, right? Yeah. No, don't, don't, just in case you get it. Um, <laughs> oh, it's fine. It's a challenge. Um, that is huge. What Walla does next is very big. Um, how the Titans react. I mean, there are moments in this and, and, drawn so incredibly by Lucas and Ivan that yeah there's so much to come there's every there's a cliffhanger on on every issue yeah that's the joy of serialized storytelling right it's those issues that make you want to go back and wait for the next one and pick it up from your comic shop so absolutely has there been anything that surprised you as you've because you've talked about the plan this is a plan. There's so yeah. many different people. This is the ultimate comic book collaboration. There's people from all over the world working on it. As that story's grown and shifted, has there been anything that surprised you about the direction of the story or the characters? Sure. Well, I actually wrote two outlines and wow. one was kind of the safe outline. And then there was this sort of chaos idea that I threw <laughs> in there and said, look, I'm going to tack this on the end of the outline, and this obviously changes the story in a huge way, um, but if you would be comfortable with me doing this, can we do this? And DC were instantly like, yes. And I'm like, I'm going to go rewrite this outline, <laughs> and we're going, to, we're going to do this now. And that was a great surprise that, to have that idea embraced so quickly. And, you know, this is all very vague. I apologize. Um, I can't give you – there will be spoilers uh, as you read the comic books. 
you will find out spoilers. That's how uh, how storytelling works. works. Yeah. (laughs) I don't think that the DC Instagram is the correct place for spoilers. So I think you're doing a very good job seeing as all the readers here are actually going to want to know about it and what happens as it happens. But I love the idea that we are getting the chaos version of BC. Yeah. That's very exciting. I mean, Dr. Haid is literally wearing the helm of the Lords of Chaos. So, Mm -hmm. you know, this is the chaos is a big element here. That's fantastic. And before we sign off, I want to ask you if, how angry do you think people will be about Beast World? Like, what's the scariest Ooh, thing you're going to do? Oh, no. <laughs> um, <laughs> I won't tell you the scariest thing I'm going to do, but, look, people will be angry sometimes, you know. This is how storytelling works. Yeah. Things, people, sometimes things hurt. If, they, if you're not angry, if you don't care at all, we have failed in our mm-hmm. role as creators. You know, if, you know, we want you to care. Things have to hurt. But there's also fun and there's joy and there's love and there's mm. laughter and there's ridiculous jokes and there's surprises um, and there's everything you want in an event. Um, if you've read any of my work, particularly Elseworlds work, any of my Deceased or Injustice or Dark Knights of Steel, this is the first time I've gotten to have sort of those boundaries removed in continuity. So I am just going for it with a group of incredible creators and it's fun. Please don't be too angry with me. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I mean, that <laughs> In was, advance. The, that was yeah. the best sales pitch ever. And I'm sure <laughs> we got some great moments we loved. You know, we get that, we get Gar and Raven, we get that stuff. And then we get that gut punch that you're so good at in that first issue. So I can't wait to see what else is going to happen in this event. And thank you so much for joining us and talking to thank us you. in this live Thanks stream. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Really appreciate it.